Hey guys, Lindy Pearson here. Uh, my husband and I work with a great firm called Cressa, which is also our sponsor for this episode today. Uh, we are a commercial real estate firm, but unlike most firms in our industry, our niche is just representing the tenants. Tenants, tenants, tenants. We help the business owners, the C-level executives. We help them make them, you know, make better real estate decisions and, you know, better decisions for their facilities. So, you know, saving the money in the process is something that we kind of cherish for us. So Level Up also, it's, you know, featuring entrepreneurs, leaders, other professionals who have demonstrated agency and innovation in their personal and professional lives. So today's guest, very timely given that we're all in this working from home experiment and it just happens to be Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So unless you've somehow been on some remote island in the Caribbean or Indian Ocean, which yes, I wish I was there, um, and you've avoided working on a computer for the last five years, you've heard the countless stories about cyber attacks. Protecting our personal information from these sorts of crimes has become a huge, huge industry in itself. So while most companies focus on the technology, protecting the hardware and software, that make our computers safe, my guest today has a different angle on this growing problem. Turns out no matter how much cybersecurity software we have, no matter how good our companies think they're protecting us, it's really us, it's the users, it's the employees. We're the ones that might accidentally click that little button. Uh, so Zach's newest company focuses on cybersecurity training in a very creative and unique way. So I'll let Zach tell you more as we go through this show. Welcome, Mr. Zach Schuler, to Level Up. Thank you, Lindy, so much for having me. Uh, looking, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's been it's been kind of crazy uh, for someone like me. I don't know what what kind of percentage I represent, but I'm not technically savvy. So people like you, it's it's so important. And even nowadays, with having you know, people who have children, online school, we're on, you know, six Zooms, at least just in my house at, at some point. And there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of security going on. There is a, yeah. one, one of my, one of my kids, I have both of my kids are both in high school and they did a fun Zoom and it turned out to be really fun because it was in the beginning of COVID when we didn't really realize you needed passwords mm -hmm. on Zoom. And, um, yeah, that was a different kind of uh, mentality going through the kids. I think it scarred them for life. Um, but did they get Zoom bombed? They did. Um, wow. They did, and uh, it was uh, there was a lot of flesh. Oof! I'm sorry to hear that. Mm -hmm. They That's loved it, but disgusting. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before you were struck with this amazing security awareness idea, um, tell us about the beginnings, the beginnings of how you started in your entrepreneurship. Yeah, so shoot, I've been an entrepreneur since uh, the age of 21. I was uh, 19, 1995. And um, uh, the way I got started, I worked for this little company called Circuit City. Um, not sure if you've heard of them before. Uh, yeah. some, of the, some of your audience will have heard of them and maybe some of the really young folks in the audience, maybe not. Uh, Circuit City was a, basically an electronics uh, store, very similar to Best Buy. And um, I had had kind of a background in computers, just kind of my dad computerized his business when I was really young, and I got really interested in that. And Circuit City, right when I joined, they kind of separated the electronics department from like boom boxes and Walkmans and everything else, and computers into their own department they called Soho, small office, home office. And so because of my knowledge of computers, I ended up becoming a sales rep, and I worked in the Soho department. Um, fast forward, uh, I would, with selling computers, I'd have probably one out of three of my customers say, you know, can you come to my house and set up my computer for me and show, show, show me how to use it and give my kids a tutorial? And remember, this is the time where the first PC was going into the home. So I wasn't going in and like replacing a computer. I was putting a computer in for the very first time. You were like, you were like the geek squad before the geek squad? I was the geek squad before the geek squad, and it's a whole other story, but I pitched Circuit City on the geek squad, and they said, ah, that would never work. Um, anyhow, from the year 1995 to 1997, after um, being asked so many times, can you come into my house and set this up for me, I finally found an opportunity to do that. And so 
between those two years, I had gone into over 500 people's homes and set up their computers for them. And then naturally when something would break, and I wasn't formally trained in this area, but when something would break, they would call me and say, hey, Zach, something's not working. Can you come out and fix it? And so I ended up becoming the fix-it guy. So not just the setup and tutorial guy, but the fix-it guy. And I uh, graduated in 1997 with a degree in marketing, uh, business marketing from Cal State Northridge. Um, and got to a point where I was getting really bored showing people how to click and right click and double click and, you know, doing these sorts of things. And I said, wow, there's got to be something bigger and better for me out there. And I learned about, um, you know, the fact that, you know, business networks were, were kind of a, starting to become a big deal, right? Where businesses were networking all their computers together. One of the main reasons was so they could share internet access through something like a T1. Um, and so I went and got my Microsoft certification to set up business networks. In fact, my home clients. And for many of my home clients, they could afford to pay me 40 bucks an hour to come into their home. They were either business executives or small business owners themselves. And so I went marketed to them and say, hey, I can now do what I do at your home. I can do it at your business. And so in a very, very short period of time, uh, probably within about six months, I got so busy, I had to hire um, a guy to take over my home client business. Then I hired another guy to help me on the business side. And we just kind of grew one customer, one employee at a time. Uh, the company was called Calnet Technology Group. And from, I think that, that really got its, its start like in 1997. So between 1997 and I sold the business in 2013, October 18th. So it was actually our seven year anniversary three days ago. Wow. Um, by the time I sold the business, we were doing about 20 million in annual revenue and had almost 100 employees. And so just kind of organically grew that business over, you know, 17 years. And uh, that was really my first entrance into, you know, being an entrepreneur and really where I have the most experience. Wow. That's crazy. So yeah, 1997 thanks. to 2013, about or over 100 employees. Uh, that's right. One step at a time. Um, well, there's got to be some sort of biggest struggle that you faced during all of those years yeah. growing growing yeah. pains yeah it was um it was a little more personal than that unfortunately so one of my best friends when i was in high school um worked for his dad who owned a very large uh business and he worked for his dad in the it department and as we were growing, I decided that, um, you know, we needed more staff. And so I approached him and he's like, yeah, I, I kind of have a dead end job here at my dad's company in, in IT because that's what I like to do. And I'm not really going to be able to go any higher. And I said, hey, why don't you come and, you know, work, work for me? And, you know, you'll be one of our consultants slash engineers. And he said, great. And so he worked for me for a good number of years um, and then, his father ended up passing and he was left a, a chunk of change and he had decided at that time that he was going to uh, leave CalNet and start his own uh, kind of home automation audio video company. Mm. And so sent him this, you know, big kind of going away party at PF Chang's and, and uh, you know, I wish him the best of luck and he, he had done really well for us. I mean, clients loved him. And, um, you know, about three weeks, four weeks after he left, one of my smallest clients that he used to service uh, called and said, hey, you know, we're going to be leaving Calnet and moving on to another company. And, you know, I was you know, really disappointed to hear that, but it was a pretty small client. And then another few weeks go by and another small client that he had been the main engineer on yeah. called me and said the same thing. And so now I start to go, Whoa, this is a little weird, but I just, I let it alone. They were both small customers. And right. um, then I had a big client and they called and left a voicemail. And I remember calling them back and uh, his name was Richard. And I said, so Richard, you're going to let so-and-so do this to me. Um, so-and-so being my former employee. Right. Right. And so instead of asking him whether or not this was going on, I just picked up the phone and I accused him, right? <sighs> and said, you're really going to let him do this to me and, 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 
he's like, he just sat there stunned. And, yeah, that's a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> yeah, didn't, didn't have anything to say. And then he finally was like, well, it's not my decision. It's the president's decision because he's got a good relationship with so-and-so. And uh, I said, okay, fair enough. And uh, anyhow, they, they, they left and, uh, you know, he violated his confidentiality agreement uh, with us. And so, you know, we sent, uh, attorney sent him a letter or whatever. And I think that was probably the last client that he went after. Um, but that sent me into a really, really sad state because this is a Absolutely. guy that was a best friend of mine. And I, I can remember like going on a hike to try and clear my mind. And I literally started to cry. Oh, I just got and, the chills. Yeah. And it, it, it just felt so bad that he would do this and that he would break up a friendship like that. And so I, th I think the learning lesson there is that be prepared if you, I'm not saying don't ever hire friends. But just be prepared that anybody has the capacity to pretty much do anything. And I talked to him a couple years later, and he essentially said to me, which is not accurate, he said, if you were in my situation, you would have done the same thing. Wrong. And I said to myself, absolutely not. Wrong. If I just inherited a bunch of money. And uh, you know, I really didn't need to work anymore. Or maybe I did, but I certainly didn't need to steal other people's customers to do it. Yeah, I, I would not have done that. But just be prepared if you hire a friend. And my advice would be stay away from hiring friends if you can. But if you do, just be prepared to know that anybody can do anything. That's tough. A best a, friend? Yeah. A bestie? Yeah, Ugh. that was a struggle. That, that, that is. a struggle. Oh man, I actually, I know a lot of stories about you, but I, I didn't know that story. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that, that uh, we're on to bigger and better things. I think, we are. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think when you, when, when a situation takes you out of your comfort zone and while you're busy chiseling away at yourself, you're going through a transform, transformative growth, you know, and uh, it sucks when you're, when your ego is bruised and uh, hurt, oh, yeah. but uh, look at where we are right now, right? We're in a um, good spot. Yeah. So um, obviously where we are now, you have created another success story. Um, so what are in your journey uh, since 1997 or post, I guess, uh, 2013, uh, what are the three keys to being successful as an entrepreneur that you've seen and you've established? Yeah. Um, so I think the first key in entrepreneurship is that when you're looking to start a business or a new venture, um, you have to make absolute, you have to be absolutely positively certain that you either are passionate about what you're starting or you will be passionate and that you were not doing it solely for the money because money comes and goes and it, it might be exciting at first if you have a business that makes money and it's something that you're not passionate about, but it will fade very quickly. And so the first thing that I think about when I think about, you know, starting a business, it's got to be a something that I'm really into that I'm really excited and passionate about. Um, I would say that the second thing is be prepared to grind, mm. right? Like when I started my second business and, you know, I hired my first employee, I was the guy that bought the computer I set the computer up. I got under the desk on my knees. I plugged everything in. I made it perfect for the employee. I, I had to make their business. Like all of these things I had to do where my old company with a hundred people, I had an HR department. They did all that stuff. I had an IT department. They did all that right, stuff, right? right? Starting a new business, you gotta be prepared to grind. And, and, and if you had another business prior to that, like be prepared to get on your hands and knees 
you know, to do things. And so I, I, I would say that that's, that's number two. And, you know, don't give up. Um, when, and we're going to explain what Ninjio is here in a second, but when I did my first kind of proof of concept and I showed my first episode to a group of uh, business owners that I was really lucky enough to have the opportunity to present the first episode to, um, we showed the episode to everybody and this is pre-COVID, right? So we're all in a conference room and the moderator of the group uh, basically says, how many of you out there would be interested in purchasing something like that? That's my dog, by the way. Um, and out of the 17 people that were there, there were two hands that went up. And I said, uh-oh, I'm, I, I, there's something I didn't do right. You know, I've got two out of 17 people interested in what I think everybody should be interested in. Right. And the feedback that we got was, you know, your episode was too long. And so I went back and I shortened it and edited it down, made it better, got it less than four minutes. Um, the moderator had reshared the episode and I got a whole bunch of thumbs up. Yes. Right. So I didn't give up. I didn't say, oh, they don't like it. I'm leaving. It's like, okay, what didn't they like? How do you fix it? How do you make it better? How do you improve on the product? And don't just take your first go around and think that if they don't like that, it's time to call it a day, right? Sure. Um, a, lot of, a lot of startups call it pivoting. This wasn't really a pivot. A pivot is where you like really kind of move in a different direction. I do a completely different thing. This is just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, tweaking on, uh, on the product. And we did that and it, and it became a success. So, you know, don't give up. I think that would be my, my third big, you know, teachable moment here. Especially now. I mean, the hustle is real. I think there's there's a lot of industries right now where you're doing the same amount of work. You're either making less. For me, it's uh, less square footage these days. But, you know, there's, there's, you know, think about travel agents when you book a trip and they keep doing it again and rebooking and going and doing. They're only getting paid to book the one trip no matter how many times it goes. But no one's giving up. We're still going. We're still pushing forward. Um, yeah. So mentioning all these episodes and stuff, um, we haven't really discussed uh, your newest company. So if you could tell us a little bit, uh, you know, expand more about the beginnings of Ningio. Absolutely. So when I was a, when I was running Calnet, we would see our clients um, on occasion succumb to a security breach, and. Um, when that would happen and we would investigate how it happened, almost every single instance of it was somebody clicking on something stupid, right? Somebody doing something that they shouldn't have that let the bad guy in. Right. And I had a fleeting thought of if I could only teach people what to do and what not to do and educate this company's employee base, I would save the company a lot of heartache. And I call it a fleeting thought because I did have the thought, but then I'm like, okay, I'm running a hundred person managed services provider. Am I really going to start a training company right now? Right. <laughs> I've kind of got a one track mind. And the answer was no, not yet, not now. And so, you know, as we know, CalNet, I sold that business in 2013. I helped my dad with his business and, and getting that off the, you know, not off the ground, but getting revenues. We doubled inside of a year and then sold that. And then I was reading an article in a industry trade publication about the horrific state of security awareness and how it simply doesn't work. And I went onto YouTube and I Googled, I didn't Google, I went onto YouTube and I typed in, in, in the search, security awareness training. And the first thing that came up was a 45 minute long death by PowerPoint lecture of, Feel me. yeah, exactly. Do this, don't do that, click here, don't click there, watch out for this type of thing. And literally I timed it. In the first 10 minutes, the lecture went over 14 different security topics. I would, I would already be on my phone or checking emails or just, you know, tuning totally. out. It would have been minimized. You'd been doing your outlook and everything. And yep. when it was over, you pull it back up and say complete whatever, and you would not have paid attention. 
And I'm like, there is no way that people are learning from this. And if they do even learn a tidbit, there's no way they're going to be able to retain that information. And so I kind of put myself in the frame of mind of like, you know, Joe, your typical end user working on a computer day in and day out, right? Exposed to these threats. How would I want to learn about these things? And so the first thing I figured out was you got to make it short, right? And I did some research and uh, I didn't even know this term existed, but it's called micro learning. And so I was like, oh, great. We're going to do stuff in micro learning. The second thing was, is I said, you know, when I get lectured to, I kind of zone out. I do too. You know, but if somebody's telling me a story, I can get a little bit more captivated. And what I figured out was that you can get emotionally engaged into a story, but you cannot get emotionally engaged into a lecture. And so I figured I want to do security awareness through storytelling. I researched storytelling as a medium for education. Turns out it's a really good way to teach people. And then I said, I've got to make it the best that it can be, right? We're in Los Angeles. We are in the entertainment capital of the world. So I got together with an old um, college friend of mine, a guy named Bill Haynes. Uh Uh-oh, another friend? Another friend, yep. Uh, uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, Bill and I were not best friends. uh, I'm just giving you you a hard time. Yeah, no, we were not best friends, and, 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 you know, we had kind of had contact every, you know, few years throughout the years after college, right? But Bill, in a weird series of events, became a writer for the new series of Hawaii Five O and CSI New York. And when I had the idea of doing these, like, little micro stories about security, I approached him, and he's like, well, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but I'm in. I know the last business that you did was a success, and so I'll give it a shot. And uh, we gave it a shot. And at the end of the day, what we're doing is producing uh, three to four minute long animated episodes that are all story based. We focus on an actual security breach that has really happened. And the reason that we do that is because we want to pull the excuse away from the end user of this will never happen to me. Yes, it will happen to you. It happened to them. We're telling the story about how it happened to them. Right. right? And so, um, and then we've got, uh, as of uh, last month, we started this in the beginning of this year, but as of last month, every episode features a celebrity actor. That's cool. So we've got uh, Robert Davi, who's probably best known for being uh, one of the bad guys in the movie Goonies, if you can remember back that long. I love goodies. 1985, I think. Um, and then uh, we've got John Lovitz, who was on Saturday Night Live for five years in a row, and, you know, a very yes, famous yeah. actor, comedian. We've got a, uh, a famous uh, black comedian named uh, Alex Thomas. And, uh, the, the, you know, the cast is growing bigger and bigger. And so essentially that's what we do. We put out a new episode every month based on the latest security breach. And we license that content to companies everywhere from my eight person dental office to a 200,000 user uh, federal government agency. Yeah. You know what? I also read, sorry to interrupt on the website that, and I could have this uh, term wrong, but there's like a a nano something. Yeah. 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 So, so part of our product is called Ninjio Nano. Um, and essentially what we do is we take our four minute long story, we truncate it down to a minute and 30 seconds. And so if you really, really have a really short attention span (laughs) and you can only watch a minute and 40 seconds instead of three to four minutes, then we've made a product for those people. I think, I think that's, that's really important because the 45 minute lecture or even the 10 minute lecture, no one likes the lecture, but do you have that time? You know, when you get that you know, sexual harassment training or this training, it always goes to the bottom of your emails because you're like, oh, I never want to do this. I don't want to participate. This is annoying and boring. But when right. you have the three to four minute or even two minutes, one to two minutes, I think it's, I think it's very workable. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. And it's, you know, we, we've had a lot of our clients, employees classify it as an employee benefit, a four minute break out of their workday. 
you know, and so it's like, oh, cool, I get to take a break and watch a Ninja episode, you know, because they're, you know, relatively entertaining. No, I, I've, I've learned some uh, very simple things, according to you, but um, these things that take, you know, six to ten seconds to do, um, they've definitely saved me on a couple of things. And I am an end user, you know. I am one of those people that clicks on whatever lecture we're supposed to do. I hope my company is watching. And, you know, I, I pick and choose what I'm going to take out of it, you know. Yeah. All right, so tell me something that you're working on right now that really excites you. I know that you've you've started companies, you've helped build companies, you've been through some trials and tribulations uh, with hiring and firing. Uh, what what's going on now? Well, I think uh, it, it, it still has to do with work, and it still has to do with Ninjio. Uh, but we've uh, we've been asked by a ton of our clients to ninjify their HR training. Right. Uh, we all know how boring and awkward HR training is these days. And uh, from the research that we've done, it doesn't look like anybody's taken the same approach that, you know, we've taken in security awareness training. And so uh, beginning of this year, we embarked on an endeavor called Ninjio HR. And uh, probably about three months ago now, I hired uh, a woman by the name of Marta Boda, who's a 20-year veteran in the HR industry, to be Ninjio HR's practice manager. And um, we, did, uh, we did a few episodes. Um, I think out of the first three that we did, there was probably one that was like a, like a genuine like good keeper. And then we just did this last episode on unconscious bias. And... Uh, it, it just, it, it's phenomenal. It just, it, it came out really well. You know, I think we went through that learning curve of like what works and what doesn't. And this has just come out really well. And what's interesting timing is that literally today, we have made a very, we've been waiting until we've had like this really great piece of content to announce HR to everybody. And so literally today, we made an announcement that it's a massive email blast. And so um, this morning, I've had probably 10 to 15 uh, both clients and pros prospects reply and say, wow, that was a great episode. Um, and Thank I'd love you. to know more about Ninja HR. And so you know, it's kind of branching off and, you know, talking about, you know, topics that are very timely right now with all the, you know, stuff that's going on. And, uh, you know, our, our next episode is about, employee wellness and we're really focused on burnout right because right? you're yeah there's like a there's like a level of toxic productivity that's going on you know that's exactly right and 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 so in in this lesson we really focus on you know teaching people how even though your computer is sitting right in front of you while you might be in your kitchen eating dinner you know how to disconnect Right. And how to how to separate yourself from work and the things that you can do even during the work day during your breaks um, to really try and maintain a positive uh, frame of mind. So th that's that's our latest endeavor. I'm super excited about it. Love I it. think that, you know, it goes it just goes along with our theme of helping people. Yep. And it's not it's not a compliance driven HR type of thing where like the HR company can. Or, or the head of HR can replace everything that we're doing because, you know, like, especially in the state of California, starting January 1, if you're five employees or more, you have to provide two hours of sexual harassment training to managers and one hour to staff. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we do micro learning, the three to four minute songs. There's no <laughs> way we're going to be able to meet these time requirements. And I think training based on time is just crazy, but that's our, right. that's our state. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Um, but it, it is, it is training and awareness. that's really aimed at kind of helping people have better conversations at work and, you know, helping them deal with working from home and all that kind of fun stuff. I think, I think that's, you know, it's kind of funny to say company culture, again, working from home and people have these very flexible schedules. But, you know, I think we're in the process and you are too of establishing a new kind of culture. I hate to say, you know, the new normal, the this, the that, but there is, there's going to be, you know, different, different schedules, different things that are going to be emerging in companies. Yeah. 
you need to deal with in order to, to get everyone on the same page. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh, I don't like saying the new normal anymore either <laughs> because exactly. we, we, are, we are in the new normal. What I like talking about is the next normal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's the next normal going to look like when, you know, everybody's vaccinated and COVID kind of goes away and we start to like just live our lives like we did in 2019. Um, what's the next normal look like? And hopefully it doesn't look that much different than the old normal, right? Because the old normal is pretty darn good. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I'm grateful for that I took uh, for granted for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I know that you have been growing in your office space and I know you've been taking lots of different uh, things that are going on in terms of different suites. How is your physical space coming along? Do you have people coming into your office? Uh, yeah, we kind of go back and forth depending upon um, COVID and, and who might have been exposed and all that sort of stuff. So right now we are on a bit of a quarantine from the office. Oh, okay. uh, when we were back at the office, uh, and we still do have a few people there, I think we have, you know, maybe five people. When we were back at the office, we were at about 50% capacity, so about 50% working from home, 50% at the office. We have gone into a pretty massive hiring spree, and so to totally be honest with you, I have no idea that once we go 100% back to the office, I have no idea if I can fit everybody. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, with our current spot, we, you know, kind of grew out of our first space, moved into a second space, grew out of that, but we kept that. We added space upstairs. Now we're going to grow out of that. There's no more space in this little building that we have. And so that's where I need you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so unfortunately our lease isn't up for a couple of years. I think it'd be pretty easy to sublease our space because yeah. we're, we're actually in retail space, which is really odd, but we really like the location. And uh, we're going to have to get, out of that, get in a more traditional open office space. But, um, you know, probably not time to start the process a year, according to Rick. Uh, might be, you know, six, six to 12 months we start the process yeah. of really looking at yeah you know, a much larger space that can accommodate everybody. Because even, even in the next normal for us, um, while I think working from home is okay and can be done on occasion, I'm big on collaboration. And I'm big on being able to like go over to the desk next to me and say, hey, did you just see that email from that customer? And yeah. we need to get on that, you know? Yeah. And it's so it's just so hard to do that from home and to have camaraderie from home and build, you know, build a great company culture from home. So the next normal for us is going to be going back to all being in the office. That's great to hear for someone like me. Um, obviously, yeah. we know there's, you know, office and industrial space is a whole new beast. So, I mean, on one hand, it's amazing that you're growing because there are some companies that are having some super tough times right now. Yeah. And, um, you know, they've had to lay off some employees for good. They've had to, you know, um, sublease their space. I know some people that have had to walk away from their space. Yeah. Um, so, you so know, I, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a disaster. It is. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just so fortunate that we're in a business where, you know, we're trying to keep people safe from cyber threats. And between COVID scams and people working from home and the bad actors realizing that they can attack people at home when the technology defenses just aren't there, it's really made our, our offering very, very attractive to some of the largest companies in the world. Literally, some of the largest companies in the world are now using our stuff. So uh, we're, we're, we're very blessed and fortunate that, that, uh, that's happened. And, uh, you know, at the same time, we've done some, some really good things by, you know, uh, providing a lot of content, uh, at no cost to those people who are working from home. And, and, you know, we really tried to get back, uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and so, yeah, but it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Didn't you just win, didn't, wasn't there an award, uh, uh, something, I saw something on LinkedIn, uh, 2020 something? Yeah, so from uh, a publication called CIO Bulletin, we won uh, 
10 best cybersecurity companies in 2020. Good job. Uh, yeah, so that, that, was, that was pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. So right. Cool. Well, thank you for being here today. Um, definitely our listeners and viewers have learned a lot. We know where to find you. We'll have all your information readily available. And awesome. uh, yeah, I can't wait to have you on another episode to see how this uh, new three to four minute Endeavor HR is going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'll be excited to share that with you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Lindy, so much for having me. I had a great time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, invite me back anytime. We'll do it again. All right. Sounds Take good. Care. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.